Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this lecture on uh, the Dirac delta function. Uh, in today's lecture, we will be discussing a very interesting function which is the Dirac delta function. Uh, this uh, lecture is part of module 2 from your mathematical physics 3 course. Um, this is the plan uh, for this lecture. So, first we will just introduce you to the Dirac delta function and um, along with a uh, brief discussion on the properties, the important properties of this function. Then uh, there is some how to find out the derivatives of the Dirac delta function. Then after that we will we'll try to obtain the Fourier transform of the Dirac delta function and uh, we will end with uh, different representations of this particular function. Okay, so, uh, coming to the Dirac delta function, this is basically a generalized distribution function which was introduced by the quantum physicist Paul Dirac. Uh, he had introduced this uh, as a way, as a tool for um, uh, modeling the density of an idealized point mass or a point charge. Uh, so, if I, uh, if you remember when, when in, uh, in our mechanics or in electromagnetism, we have this concept of a point mass or a point charge. So, we define a point mass or a point charge as something that has, that has got a mass or a charge, but does not have any size because it is concentrated at a point. So, how do we idealize such uh, such an object? So, the Dirac delta function was basically used to, uh, I, uh, to uh, represent such uh, objects uh, mathematically. So, uh, but uh, the calculations which were uh, made by physicists using the Dirac delta function, uh, it used to appear as uh, nonsensical to the mathematicians. Uh, but it was only after uh, the idea of distributions were introduced by Lorentz Schwartz that uh, the Dirac delta function was uh, formalized. Uh, in engineering and uh, signal processing, the Dirac delta function is also known as the unit impulse symbol. Um, because uh, if you remember from your uh, high school uh, physics, uh, an impulse is basically when a force is applied, uh, we talk about impulse when a force is applied, a large amount of force is applied for a very short duration of time. Like for example, when a bat uh, it hits a ball, right. So, for most of the time, for a larger amount of time, the f impulse acting on the ball due to the bat is 0, but it is only for a small fraction of time that there is a large spike in the impulse that is being delivered. So, the Dirac delta function it helps us to model that. So, that is why it is uh, also known as a unit impulse symbol. So, uh, you can uh, regard uh, a Dirac delta function as some kind of a sequence of functions. So, I basically I have a sequence of functions and uh, I can set these sequence of functions as uh, uh, to a certain limit and when I do that we will get a tall spike at the origin. So, in fact, we will be actually doing uh, this. Uh, we will be using uh, the Fourier transforms to show that the Dirac delta function can be uh, written as a uh, limit of uh, uh, a sequence of harmonic functions. So, uh, this is the basic property that the Dirac delta function must satisfy. The, the property is the Dirac delta function, it takes the value, I mean uh, here T is the argument. Okay. So, wherever, whenever this argument, okay, whatever that means whatever is there inside the bracket, okay, whenever this argument takes the value 0, okay, t equals 0, whatever is inside the bracket that is the argument. So, wherever the, whenever this argument takes the value 0, then the Dirac delta function will tend towards infinity and whenever this argument is not 0, then in that case the Dirac delta function will be exactly equal to 0 and this is an idealized representation of the same. Okay, so, here we have uh, the x axis so over here we have different uh, numbers which are mapped out over here and at the point 0 the Dirac delta function it just shoots up there is a large spike and it goes all the way it tends towards infinity and basically it does not go to it does not actually take the value infinity it basically takes a very large value at uh, whenever this argument of the Dirac delta function takes the value 0. At all other places it takes the value, uh, it, it takes the value 0. Only when the argument takes the value 0, the Dirac delta function it gets a spike. Now, uh, we could also uh, bring in what is known as the translation property. Remember like I said, whenever the argument takes the value 0, 
at that point you get a large spike so instead of having an argument t uh, argument as t if i put an argument t minus a okay if i put delta of t minus a what will that happen what will happen in that case what will happen is the dirac delta function instead of taking a spike at t equal to 0 it will take a spike at t equal to a the spike will be shifted it will be translated from 0 it will be translated all the way till t equals a okay because uh, again uh, how do you understand this because you see like I said the argument of the Dirac delta function wherever it takes 0 there is going to be a spike so what is the argument here here the argument is t minus a so if I put t equal to a then a minus a that's the that's the point where the argument will become 0 so that means that t equal to a will get that spike in a similar way if I put in the argument I put t plus a then what will happen is the function is going to shift towards the negative side okay and we will get whenever i put t equal to minus a here so minus a plus a the argument becomes zero so that's where at t equal to minus a this function is going to spike all the way upwards and uh, take a very large value so this is the translation property of the direct delta function but the fundamental defining property of this function is basically this okay so what does it say it says that uh, i have this um, let's say i have any function okay any any arbitrary function of t f of t and uh, to that function i multiply the dirac delta function um, i apply the translation property in general um, i evaluate the dirac, the dirac delta function is supposed to have a spike at some point a so delta of t minus a I multiply the arbitrary function with the translated direct delta function and then I integrate from a lower limit m to an upper limit n. Okay, The result of this integration will be the value of this function at this point a. Okay, And this will hold good if and only if this a, okay, this point a, it lies within this range that is this range that whatever I'm in the integration limits the lower limit and upper limit that is going to define a particular range so within that range if this point a is included then this property will be satisfied so graphically this is what happens here so I have some function f of a okay f of t okay so I have some function f of t which is represented by this maroon line and this blue line represents the Dirac delta function so I have I'm writing it as delta of t minus a okay that means the spike has been shifted from t equal to 0 till t equal to a so this is where the spike is now when I take the product of these two functions that maroon line this function and this blue line this function see everywhere else this uh, direct delta function takes 0 so the product of f of t and direct delta function at all these points this point this point this point all these points and all these points the product will be always zero so what is finally left out is the value of the function the value of the function at this point is f of a so the value of the function at f of a okay that is what will be left out and we say that the product that that is f of a and delta t minus a okay at this point at, at t equal to a this product is going to eventually give us f of a because uh, here we are doing integration integration is nothing but uh, infinite summation so you, all you do is point by point you just multiply okay everywhere else the direct delta function takes the value 0 so other points they will not contribute the only contribution will be from this point a and that, that will give us the value of the function at a so you can see here the direct delta function can be used to sample a certain function so suppose I have a function all I need to do is just multiply this direct delta function by uh, placing the direct delta function at various different points okay point a okay let's say point a is here and, a, and point a is here and point a is here so I choose different uh, intervals at which I take this point a so I'll be essentially I'll be able to sample this uh, function f of a so basically what I have done here is I'm just moving the direct delta function that spike I'm just translating it along the uh, t axis I'm keeping this function f same and I'm just translating it so in that process what happens is I'm able to sample this function itself so basically what I have done here is I have taken a convolution of this function but anyway we will not uh, um, go into convolution right now because I, I, I have another lecture dedicated to convolution so we'll keep it for that so so what you have to remember is this is the fundamental property that the Dirac delta function it must satisfy 
Okay, so uh, from here we can draw an important conclusion. The conclusion is suppose I say this A is equal to 0, that means I don't translate it, I keep the direct of that spike. Okay, I keep that spike, the spike, let's say I keep that spike at okay, the origin. Okay, so let us say A equal to 0. Okay, then delta of t minus A will be simply delta of t. And this function f of t, I take it as 1. That means we are taking the constant function. Here, the function, it is changing with t. I'll consider a function which is flat, which is just a horizontal line, which passes through along the y-axis, which passes through 1. That means that's a constant function. So f of t is equal to 1. So we'll, that's a, just a special case. So if I take a to be 0 and this function f of t to be equal to 1, that means this function is 1 everywhere. So a is 0, then what is the value of the function at f of a? f of a is f of 0, which is equal to 1, because this function is 1 everywhere. So now using this, okay, and of course, we will define m, okay, m will take it as a negative quantity and uh, n will take it as a positive quantity. So if m is negative and n is positive, okay, the lower limit is negative, upper limit is positive, that means the origin will lie somewhere in between m and n. So which means the condition was that uh, range of integration it should include this point t equal to a and here a is equal to 0 m i am taking it as negative and n i am taking it as positive that means a equal to 0 that point is also definitely included here so it means this fundamental property for the direct delta function it is satisfied so i can just apply this here so f of t is 1 delta t minus a is nothing but delta t dt and f of a is equal to 1. So from here we find that if you integrate the Dirac delta function okay, from um, between two points okay, m and n such that m is negative and n is positive then uh, the integration of this is going to be equal to 1. And we can of course generalize this. Okay, uh, The integration of the Dirac, translated Dirac delta function delta t minus a when you translate it by a certain amount this also will be equal to 1 provided this m n here m and n it was it included this origin this point a equal to 0 here in general if m and n it includes this point a then also this condition will be satisfied so this is the more generalized uh, form of this particular uh, conclusion that we have drawn from the fundamental defining property then there are lots of other properties as well. Um, I mean, the proof of these properties are not required, you're just required to uh, know them. So first is the reflection property, that is the Dirac delta function, uh, whether you take the t or the minus t, the function will remain the same. Then this, this is known as scaling property. So if uh, t is multiplied with a, then uh, it will give us the Dirac delta function without that a, that, uh, that multiplying factor, and uh, we'll have to, of course, divide it by the modulus of a. And the sifting property, the sifting property is basically which says as any function which is continuous at t equal to 0. Okay? Suppose I have any function which is continuous at t equal to 0, then the product of this function and the Dirac delta function will be the value of the function at t equal to 0 times the Dirac delta function. Okay, so that is the sifting property, very useful property which of course we will be using it, we'll be, uh, using it much later in uh, the convolution when we study convolution of uh, functions then uh, of course from here it follows that uh, t into delta t is equal to 0 how because if i take f of t equal to t okay f of t is equal to t that's a linear function right f of t equal to t it's a straight line which passes through the origin so a straight line which passes through the origin f of t okay the value of f of t that is what then what will be the value of f of 0 value of f of 0 because f of t equal to t that means f of 0 will be equal to 0 okay so f of t is equal to t delta t is equal to this will be 0 so on the right hand side we have 0 so this uh, follows from the sifting property of the Dirac delta function then uh, the derivatives of the Dirac delta function uh, there is a theorem which uh, specifies um, how we can um, think about uh, the, which introduces the notion of the derivative so it says that the derivative that delta prime of t is such that if i have any arbitrary function f of t okay so what is the derivative of the direct delta function the derivative of the direct delta function is this such that you give me any arbitrary function f of t 
then if I integrate the product of that function and the derivative of the Dirac delta function, that will give me the negative of the value of the derivative of this function at the origin. Now this can be very easily proved, Okay, it's uh, very straightforward, we just need to use the integration by parts. So here we have, we are supposed to find out what this is, Okay, the integration of f of t and delta prime of t dt. So we just expand this by uh, integration by parts. So what will that do? So we are having a product of one function and a derivative. We are having a product of integration of a product of one function and a derivative of the other function. So by integration by parts, what will happen is the product of the two functions evaluated at the limits minus the integral okay, where the derivative has been swapped. Okay. So we take the function f and we take the function delta multiply them and then evaluate them at the lower limit and the upper limit which is minus infinity and plus infinity minus okay uh, the same integral except this uh, prime the deriv derivative sign it appears on the other function that is f prime of t delta t uh, into dt okay and we are integrating over that so this is integration by parts so uh, what will the value of this be the value of this will be also obviously zero because the Dirac delta function okay very far away from the origin it takes the value infinite it takes a value zero everywhere else so at minus infinity and plus infinity the Dirac delta function will take the value zero so this at the lower as well as the upper limit it will be zero and what will be the value of this one you see uh, we, we we are now using the fundamental defining property right so what what does the fundamental defining property say it says that if i multiply any function with the direct delta function which is shifted by a, a certain amount then uh, then we integrate them then that will give me the value of the function at that point a okay so basically we are just using that so f prime of t is also a function you're multiplying this with the direct delta function and here inside the bracket you could think of it as that is a t minus a of course that a is equal to zero so what will that be that will be equal to the value of this function at a and here a is zero so the value of this function at zero okay so that's why f prime of zero so from here we get the notion of the derivative of the direct delta function in a similar way, we can deduce uh, for higher order derivatives. Okay, uh, the any arbitrary function multiplied with the nth derivative of the Dirac delta function will give us minus one to the power n times the nth derivative of the function evaluated at the point zero. Okay, so now the Fourier transform of the we'll discuss the Fourier transform of the Dirac delta function. So for that, our starting point is the Fourier inversion theorem. Uh, you could uh, just have a look at one of my earlier lectures, okay, where I had uh, uh, discussed about the Fourier inversion theorem. So the Fourier inversion theorem is basically this. So suppose I have a function f, okay, and I take the Fourier transform of this function, and then after that I take the inverse Fourier transform, that will give me back the original function itself that's the Fourier inversion theorem okay so here what we'll do is we'll just do a little bit of manipulation I'll take this 1 by 2 pi inside and this du f of u I take it outside so okay, this integral integral minus infinity or plus infinity f of u uh, into du I'll take it outside and everything else I'll uh, take it inside okay so 1 by 2 pi including okay so including that we'll take everything else inside now from the fundamental defi uh, fundamental defining property of the Dirac delta function okay uh, any function multiplied with the Dirac delta function okay and integrated from minus infinity plus infinity it should give us the value of the function okay so here the function is f of u you are integrating with respect to u the Dirac delta function you are uh, shifting okay uh, with respect to t so that will give us the value of the function evaluated at t so if we now compare okay this fundamental defining property which we write uh, rewrite it in this way and call this equation number two and we compare this with equation number one then we find that the left hand side f of t we have just the same and on the right hand side we have integration du f of u till here it's, it's just the same then what we have is that means that uh, del delta of t minus u it must be equal to everything that is there on inside the brackets here so comparing this we have delta t minus u is equal to 1 by 2 pi integration e to the power i omega t minus u into d omega so we'll call this as equation number 3 
So equation number three, it shows that uh, the Dirac delta function, okay, which has got a peak at t equal to u, okay, this means it has got a peak at t equal to u, it can be considered as, what is basically this, uh, what is there inside, uh, inside this integration? This is a harmonic wave, right? This is a harmonic wave. So I have a harmonic wave and what does t minus u mean? T minus u mean, uh, it means uh, I am having a lot of harmonic waves for all different kinds of frequencies. I am having many different harmonic waves and I am integrating them. In other words, I am <coughs> adding them all together. Integration is nothing but uh, addition. So basically, I am doing a superposition of many different harmonic waves, okay, such that all of these waves, they have this, they are in phase at t equal to u equal to u all these waves they are in phase okay so if i do if i take lots of different waves of many different frequencies okay i have one frequency another frequency many different waves of different frequencies but the same amplitude okay you can see the amplitude remains the same so if i keep the amplitude same for all these waves okay but the frequency is different and all of these waves they are in phase at t equal to u and I superimpose, uh, superpose uh, all of these waves, then eventually it should give me a good approximation of the Dirac delta function. Okay, so I have uh, done a simulation of this uh, using uh, a Scilab. Uh, this is what I had done. So I am having. Uh, what I did was I uh, created many different uh, uh, harmonic waves. So this is this this is one harmonic wave. Then this is another harmonic wave, this blue line that you see, the green curve is another harmonic wave. Okay, So we have many different harmonic waves. So I'm here I'm considering five such harmonics. Okay, And you can see here, uh, an expression is e to the power i omega t minus 3. Okay, e to the power i omega t minus 3, that means u is equal to 3. Okay, u is equal to 3. I don't know if it's uh, visible to you, this is 3. Okay, so all these harmonics, they are in phase at t equal to 3, okay, at this point, they are all of them, they are in phase, okay, and they all have the same amplitude and the amplitude is 1 by 2 pi as given here, the amplitude of all these waves is 1 by 2 pi, so I, I have taken these waves which have got the same amplitude that is 1 by 2 pi and they are in phase at t equal to 3, then what should happen according to this? Now, if I add all of these waves, I should get a, eventually, if I take a large a la large enough number of such waves, harmonic waves, and I add them together, eventually what should happen is I should get something which looks like the Dirac delta function, and that should, that Dirac delta function should be peaked at t equal to u, and here u is 3. So, I should get a Dirac delta function which is peaked at 3, which has got a peak at 3. Okay. So, just to investigate this, I had done um, a simulation in Scilab. So here, uh, this is a case where we had five harmonics, just five harmonics and added them together. Then we had 10 harmonics and we just added all these waves together. Okay, this is a simple superposition of different waves. So when I took five harmonics and I added them together, we got something like this. Okay, you can see here, we are, we are getting a peak here and where does this peak occur? This peak occurs at three. Okay, this is what we expected, right? Okay, then what we do is we took uh, 10 of these from number number of harmonics from 5 we increase it to 10 so you take 10 such harmonics 10 such different frequencies okay uh, with amplitude remaining the same and we added them together then this is what we got you can see here when the harmonics were less i was having a peak at which is centered at 3 okay which is what we wanted but it was a very wide peak this does not look like a direct delta function at all but when I increase this, then this peak, it gets narrower, okay? The peak, it's, it is still at 3 and it gets narrower. Then from 10, I increase it to 50 harmonics. Then it has become even narrower. The peak is still at 3. I took 100 harmonics. It became even narrower, okay? The peak is still at 3. 500 harmonics, I get something like this. 1000 harmonics, I get something like this. 5,000 harmonics, this is what I get. 10,000 harmonics, this is what I got, okay? Uh, of course, this, this uh, simulation is not exactly the same as uh, what is given in this expression because over here, we are supposed to take all possible frequencies and uh, this is supposed to be a continuous uh, summation, but uh, here I had done a discrete summation and I took uh, um, different quanta of frequencies. So I, I took a certain frequency omega, then the next harmonic was twice omega, after that it was thrice omega, 
four times omega, five times omega, and so on. Okay, but even then, even uh, when I took that kind of an approximation, okay, the simulation it gave me what I was expecting. I was expecting a single narrow peak at u equal to three, and that's what we got. If I take uh, many such uh, harmonics, I'll get even a better and better approximation of the Dirac delta function. Of course, what is not being shown here because uh, you can you could you could think about it this way. Now here, of course, all these uh, waves they are in phase at three. Okay, so uh, but uh, if I if I go okay, this is the uh, wave. This black line it is a wave with the largest wavelength. Okay, or the largest period. So if I take from here, if I go one wavelength further, okay, on this side. Then here also all these waves they will again they will be in phase. Okay, so there also we should get a peak, and in fact that's what happens here. Uh, I'm not showed it here. That's what happens. So you get one more peak. Okay, one more peak somewhere over here around I think nine. Okay, around nine uh, we get one more peak. But then if you take more and more number of harmonics, what will happen is uh, not just at nine we'll get another peak further apart. So we'll get a series of peaks. But as the number of harmonics increases. This is the only peak which survives. All the other peaks, they gradually they will die down, and only this peak is going to survive. Okay, so uh, eventually it is going to give me a um, approximate, at least a very good approximation of the Dirac delta function. So uh, we could um, express this in this way. So suppose I want a peak at uh, u. All I need is I need uh, a lot of different waves. Now, if you remember my previous lecture on the Fourier transform, what does the Fourier domain give me? Uh, any curve in the Fourier domain, okay? Uh, the, 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 along the y-axis we have the amplitude of the wave. Along the x-axis we have the frequency of the wave. That contains all the information regarding that wave. So, if I draw a horizontal li line like this, so basically every point here. Okay, it, it tells me that the wave has got certain frequency which is given by the horizontal axis and it has got a certain amplitude which is given by the y axis. So here in this case, all the waves they have the same amplitude which is 1 by root 2 pi and they have different frequencies. So when uh, so this gives me the Fourier transform. Okay, So we get a good idea of how the Fourier transform of the Dirac delta function should look like. It will look like basically this. So the narrow, so we have a single narrow peak and then we have all possible frequencies. So this is like a limiting case okay of uh, in the previous lecture we had discussed about uh, uh, I had I, I, you could uh, have a look at uh, my previous lecture on the Fourier transforms. So over there I had uh, done another Python simulation where I had shown you uh, I think it was a uh, uh, Gaussian wave okay so so if I uh, Gaussian function when you take the Fourier transform of that. So we found out the Fourier transform as the original function becomes narrower and narrower the the Fourier transform gets wider and wider. Okay, so you could think of it that as that limit. So the original function becomes narrower. So, so when it becomes like a single narrow peak, then the Gaussian its Fourier transform will become the widest. So, so we are having something similar over here. So it gives an idea that the Fourier transform of the Dirac delta function should look something like this. So uh, how do we now represent this? So we ob obviously we'll have to use some kind of an approximation because. Uh, one way that we could do is okay. I'll assume that we have a constant function. Okay, uh, that is the Fourier transform capital F of omega for the Dirac delta function. It is equal to one by root over two pi, and then do an inverse Fourier transform and it, just check if it gives me the Dirac delta function. Okay, that is one way. Forward way also, if we just uh, use the formula for the uh, Fourier transform, it will give me one by root two pi. But the thing is, I cannot do an inverse transform here because this uh, function it is not absolutely integrable okay if you look at the, again the previous lecture so over there the one important condition for us to, to be able to do fourier transform and its inverse is the function must be absolutely integrable now this is this function okay this absolute value everywhere is 1 by root over twice pi and when you integrate this over all possible frequencies it will give us infinity so it is absolutely it is not absolutely integrable so we cannot simply integrate this function so we need to find some other way by which you can integrate this okay so that other way what we do is instead of taking this function going from minus infinity to plus infinity what we'll do is we'll assume that this uh, Fourier transform that is capital F omega it extends from minus capital omega till plus capital omega okay now this function is absolutely integrable okay 
so you take the inverse Fourier transform of this one and once you take the inverse Fourier transform of this one then you take the limit as this omega okay this omega becomes t tends towards infinity so when you take omega tending towards infinity as that means when omega becomes larger and larger this line this horizontal line is going to become longer and longer and we'll get a approximation of the Dirac delta function so in other words the Dirac delta function can be written as okay 1 by 2 pi integration from minus infinity to plus infinity e to the power i omega t d omega okay so of course uh, why are we taking 1 by 2 pi because we had defined in the previous lecture i had defined that the f whenever you take fourier transform or inverse fourier transform we are keeping it symmetric and we had this 1 by root over twice pi why not 1 by root over twice pi actually we already had 1 by root over twice pi but here i am assuming that the um, amplitude of all these waves is 1 by root over twice pi again okay so multiply this so i'll get 1 by 2 pi in this case okay so uh, when i make this limit like capital omega go towards infinity then this goes towards minus infinity this goes towards plus infinity and we will get the approximation of the direct delta function okay so we call this as equation number four okay so this is the rectangular frequency distribution okay from uh, what this rectangular frequency distribution so we'll take a simple case wherein uh, it's having the value one the amplitude of all these waves is one so as long as the frequency remains between minus omega to plus omega okay it has got the amplitude one and everywhere else it will be zero then its uh, inverse Fourier transform will be this which we call it as small f of omega, small f omega of t that will be 1 by root over twice pi integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of f or f omega f capital omega of omega okay so that's it this is we have just used the formula for the inverse Fourier transform now uh, this limits will change because this is a rectangular distribution it has got a non-zero value only between minus omega minus capital omega and plus capital omega so this uh, lower limit this minus infinity it can be safely changed to minus omega and this plus omega infinity can be safely changed changed to omega and we will get these new limits and of course the value of this f omega okay of omega we will just keep it as one because that's what we had assumed to just uh, for simplicity we had assumed it to be uh, having an amplitude of one so we'll take it as just simply as one here just call this as equation number five now evaluating this is very straightforward we are differentiating with respect to omega so e to the power i t i t is the constant so the result will be e to the power i omega t divided by i t integration from minus capital omega to plus capital omega so now uh, i take this i from the denominator i'll take it to the numerator so i'll get a minus sign so minus i and this t remains be behind in the denominator root over twice pi and then substitute the limits here so upper limit is i capital omega into t okay this omega will take this capital omega minus substitute the lower limit so we'll get a minus i capital omega into t and this we can easily recognize this is equal to twice i into sine of omega t okay so this i and i when you multiply this we will get i square which is going to give us a minus one that minus one and this minus one will will cancel out and as a result we will get two by under root of twice pi sine of omega t by t now of course we we'll like we'd like to uh, express this uh, in a more convenient form so for that we will just multiply and divide by capital omega and we write it like this so twice omega divided by root over 2 pi sine omega t divided by omega t call this equation number 6 okay so this function it is a very familiar function it, this it, this uh, function is known as a sink function that is sine theta divided by theta this is known as a sink function uh, sink function is uh, we encountered the sink function when we studied a single slit diffraction okay um, we are interested in the intensity of a single slit uh, due to a single slit diffraction that intensity will be the square of a sink function okay and how do we get the square we get the square because the electric field okay the intensity is uh, square of the amplitude and the amplitude will be a sink uh, a sink function so that's why you get the sink square and that's why in the single slit diffraction we could get those familiar uh, central peak and the secondary peaks and so on okay so this sink function is a very uh, convenient way okay for us to express 
this uh, function. So now uh, we know that the sync function, okay, as theta tends to zero, this will take the value one. Now it looks like the sine theta by theta it has got a uh, singularity at theta equal to zero because you are trying to divide by zero. But no, this singularity is a removable singularity because uh, we can just we can express sine theta as its uh, series in a series expansion, and it will take all these odd terms. The first term will be theta, second term will be theta cube, then theta to the power five and so on and we have dividing by theta okay so that theta will get cancelled and then every subsequent value except the first one the first one will be one all the other subsequent values when you put theta equal to zero will become zero so this its limit will be equal to one so it means at uh, omega t okay at t equal to zero okay this is going to get this is going to become one so the value of this function at t equal to zero will be twice omega by root over twice pi then uh, at t equal to plus or minus pi by omega sine of omega t will take plus or minus pi and which of course will be again zero so this function will take the value zero at plus or minus pi by omega so this is our equation number four and this is equation number five so from equation number four okay from this particular equation what we'll do is we'll take this one by two pi we'll take just split the two pi and we'll take one by root two pi outside and this will leave the remaining uh, part that is one uh, the limit as omega tends to infinity 1 by root over twice pi integration from minus omega at all plus capital omega e to the power i omega t d omega now from equation number 5 we realize that this is nothing but f omega of t so the direct delta function can be written as 1 by root over twice pi the limiting case of f omega of t call this equation number 7 and of course we could just take uh, if I take the limit of this that will give us 2 pi delta of t again from equation number 6 and 7 okay so this equation this was equation number 6 and uh, here we have this equation number 7 so this is equation number 6 and 7 so from equation number 6 and equation number 7 what do we have so equation number 6 it gives us f omega of t okay and then here we are taking the limit of f omega so you just substitute here okay so replace this with this entire thing so we have 2 omega by root over twice by sin omega t by omega t and we can simplify this and we can we can say that the delta omega t is equal to limit as capital omega tends to infinity sin omega t by pi of t well, is equation number 8 so equation number 8 what does it tell us it tells us that the Dirac delta function can be represented as a limiting case of a harmonic distribution okay so when we started with our definition of the Dirac delta function it looked like as if the Dirac delta function is not really a function because uh, it seems to take all uh, it does not follow the uh, it, it uh, from uh, minus infinity all the way up to values which are slightly less than zero it has got it takes a value zero and suddenly uh, it takes a very large value Okay, which is of course uh, not, not known it, it's a very large value so it doesn't look like a function but then equation number eight says that we can still approximate this using known functions so using a harmonic function such as a sine function okay we could take uh, from here we, we could take a uh, this omega could change we could take many different we could keep on changing the value of omega so we'll get a sequence of sine omega t by pi t we'll get a sequence of functions if we change the omega here and this omega as it tends towards infinity okay it will eventually give me the Dirac delta function and uh, this is a figure I have just not so clear here I just picked it up from the math uh, works uh, Wolfram okay, uh, website and uh, so this is uh, a, a, an example of how we can represent a Dirac delta function okay we can represent a Dirac delta function using a harmonic distribution so now this is not the only representation of the Dirac delta function there are many other representations also okay we don't require the other representations for our course so I'll just uh, mention what those other representations are so for we could also represent the Dirac delta function like this okay this particular function as epsilon tends to zero okay it will eventually when you make epsilon to be extremely small it will uh, eventually uh, tend towards the Dirac delta function then we could also have a Dirac delta function which looks like this okay which can be approximated in using this particular function again in all the representations 
we are taking the limit as epsilon tends to 0. So it will also tend towards the direct delta function. Now this is very familiar. This is nothing but the Gaussian distribution. So if I have a Gaussian distribution, okay, uh, where this epsilon is uh, related to the variance of the distribution. So if I make this epsilon, the variance of the Gaussian distribution, if I make it extremely small, tend towards 0, then in that case also, we will again end up with a Dirac delta function eventually. Then uh, this is a Dirac delta function using something known as a AD function. Okay. So we could have a representation using the AD function as well. Then this is uh, another representation of the Dirac delta function using a uh, Bessel uh, function of the first order. And finally, we have uh, this again under approximation of the Dirac delta function using a Laguerre polynomial of arbitrary uh, positive order. So these are the many different representations of the Dirac delta function. So uh, you all are familiar with uh, Scilab. So I suggest, uh, I don't have any assignment for you from, uh, from this lecture. What I suggest is you could just try out these uh, representations. Okay? So you could write a Scilab function. For instance, for this one, you could write a Scilab function which will execute, which will uh, calculate uh, this function for a, a certain range of values then uh, epsilon could be a parameter then you could keep on decreasing the value of epsilon make it smaller and smaller and see if it indeed goes uh, approximates uh, towards the direct delta function likewise you could do it for this case also and of course you could also try out this one just like the simulation that i had made okay this simulation which i showed you in this lecture you could try that out also in scilab so this would be uh, your assignment for this particular lecture so with this we come to the end of this lecture uh, in the next lecture we'll be uh, discussing one more uh, extremely uh, interesting function which is known as the heavy side unit steps uh, step uh, function heavy side unit step function and together with the direct delta function you can just um, have it has got lots of applications in uh, finding out um, the fourier transform of many basic uh, functions so with this, we come to the end of this particular lecture. Thank you.